Bonjour, chers collègues. C'est un honneur d'être invité par l'Académie des sciences de la santé. En passant, j'aime Ottawa. It's a beautiful city. I don't, don't, I don't know whether you have always this weather, but it's really gorgeous. <laughs> Now, as you know, I am from Holland, and I live in a little city, and the city is called Soest. No one knows about this. But there was another family in Soest that also enjoyed living in Ottawa for a couple of years ago, a couple of years, long time ago. But they lived in Stornoway. And that's the royal family of the Netherlands. And the palace is in the same village as I live. It's a different house. <laughs> Now, it's a great honor to be here, in particular because of the two Johns because they are the top dogs in, I would say, the One Health approach of AMR, and that's very, very important. And I also would like to mention that Canada has stimulated the WHO 10 years ago to work in a One Health approach, and that was, I think, really extremely important. Now, I would like to show you a couple of slides and to give you a kind of overview of AMR and what we are doing and what the world is doing. Before doing that, I also would like to congratulate Canada for developing and approving their uh, pan-Canadian framework for action. And I know very well everyone can write down or copy a national action plan in one afternoon. But that's not the trick. The trick is to get buy-in. And this is an extremely complicated field. And I have seen several reports from Canada, and I'm very glad that finally you have this report. And I am very optimistic about what will happen in, in your country. Now, it has already been mentioned, it's a kind of tsunami, and it is the greatest threat to our medicine. I don't know, is everyone here an AMR expert? Can you raise your hand if you are an expert? Okay, two, John and John. <laughs> okay. Um, by the way, um, I think everyone knows family members or friends that passed away because of cancer. But do you know someone who passed away of antimicrobial resistance? You know one? Okay, in general, this is kind of hidden. This is not very well known and it's not, let's say, labeled as AMR. Now, But again, it is very important to realize that urinary tract infection can result in death because if you have a highly resistant pathogen and if we don't have adequate antimicrobials, we are not able to treat patients with cancer, transplants, hip replacement, and so on, pneumonias, but also foot is in danger, food security. So it's very important to know that AMR is a threat to modern medicine. And if we look at the timeline, now we know that the first antimicrobials were developed about 70 years ago. And there are a few classes developed, but if you look at the bottom line there, This is the date of discovery, and on top of that, you see when the first resistance was identified. And you can also see that the last 30 years, no new antimicrobial class has been discovered. So there are no new medicines for resistant pathogens. Now, the question, of course, is how come? What, is, what are the driving 
uh, factors behind this AMR. And I think this is a very nice insightful picture here. If you look at the right top corner, you can see, and maybe it's not easy to read it, but I will explain, you can see it's the misuse and overuse in both human medicine and in animal health or animal uh, production. Now, if you go to the left, there is another purple um, uh, circle, and that's healthcare transmission. Healthcare transmission. You go to a hospital and you leave, or not, the hospital with a nosocomial infection. And the other factor is uh, the blue, and that is uh, suboptimal dosing, including uh, falsified drugs, and the other one is uh, suboptimal rapid diagnosis. So that gives a kind of picture of the, um, the drivers of AMR. Now, this picture shows, and I will explain it a little bit, if you look at the left part of the three clusters of bars, that shows the impact of the big financial worldwide crisis, 2010-2007. Uh, now, let me see if this works. Yes, here. This one here shows the impact in the low-income countries, and you can see that it had not that much impact. But the impact was in particular, of course, on the high-income countries. Now, if you look at AMR, it's the opposite. The World Bank has developed a scenario, it's called a high AMR scenario, and they predict that in 2050, the impact is on the GDP is about 6% in the low-income countries and 3% in the high-income countries. So the poor countries will be much more affected by AMR than the rich countries. And of course, this has to do with the fact that the burden of infectious diseases is much higher in these countries. Uh, and I'm sorry, but I wanted to show some pictures that were only published, I think, one week ago, and I will read it for you. This is a picture of AMR in Thailand, and about 88,000 infections were attributed to AMR, resulting in at least 3 uh, million additional days in hospital and 30 8,000 deaths a year. And another fact is that between 2000 and 2014, the prevalence of imipenem, and that's one of the last resort antibiotics against Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Acinetobacter, increased from 10% to 22, and for Acinetobacter from 14 to 65 percent. I can tell you, if you are not an expert, these are very nasty bugs. And can you imagine that in Thailand, more than 5,200 antimicrobial products are registered with the Thai Food and Drug Administration, of which two-thirds are for humans. So this is huge, and you can understand this is not so easy to control. Now, we also would like to say a few words about TB, because TB has also uh, to deal with multi-drug resistant TB. And imagine that there are about 500,000 cases of multi-drug resistant TB, 500,000 cases worldwide. Only 25% of the cases are recognized are discovered as and diagnosed as a multidrug resistant TB. So the 75% is not discovered. Of the 25%, 80% will get treatment, and the patients who will get treatment, only half of the patients who get treatment will survive. So this is really very, very dramatic. And by the way, the treatment for multidrug resistant TB is very painful and takes a very long time and is very expensive. Now, 
We are talking a lot about the SDGs. Um, when they developed the MDGs and SDGs, AMR was not that high on the political agenda. But if you look now at the SDGs, and the third one is good health and well-being, we know that good health is at stake if there is AMR. We also know that food security is at stake, so that's the second one, that's zero hunger. And we know, um, and that will also, I will come back to that issue, that uh, the residues from hospitals, the production process in companies, and also in agriculture, will contaminate water, rivers, and so on. And that is the sixth SDG. So if we don't tackle AMR, the SDGs are in danger. Now, the use of antibiotics. I hope that in your country, the use of antimicrobials will decrease. But worldwide, we know that it will increase. And in particular, in countries like China and India, with, let's say, uh, increase of income, people are demanding more meat. And what I learned in India is that traditionally, they, f um, uh, they focus on, on vegetables, but the new generation uh, also prefers to eat meat. So imagine what that means. So the increase in protein will uh, be huge, and linked to that is also the use of antibiotics. And I will come back to that. And we know the more we use antibiotics, the more we lose. And this is uh, a picture some time ago. You can see in the right corner, it's Taiwan, it's Spain, it's France. They use a lot of antibiotics, and there is a lot of resistance. And if you go to the left bottom, you can see Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, where the consumption is not high and where there is not a big problem. This is a picture that I took from the Joint Integrated Antimicrobial um, antimicrobial uh, consumption um, report of ECDC, EFSA, and EMA. I don't know for the experts, I can really uh, recommend to scrutinize this report. It's a very interesting report. And I have just taken one example from this report, and this graph shows that if the consumption is low, and that it's, that's on the x-axis, um, the probability of complete susceptibility is high, so there is no resistance. So low use, no resistance. High use, there is resistance. It's a very nice uh, graph. And this is a, sorry, I go to the next. Um, so two years ago, it was decided no, sorry, I, I just would like to show this, but I will come back to that. Um, and the, the blue bars show the use of antimicrobials in the EU countries in animal sector. Now, there is a hundredfold difference between countries with low and high use. This has nothing to do with the amount of animals. This is milligram per kilo biomass. So some countries are big users of antibiotics and some are not. And it's interesting to know why and whether there are good reasons for that. And I can tell you there are no good reasons. Um, now, two years ago, all the countries of the world uh, approved a global action plan of the WHO. Um, what was unique in history was, at the same time, the FAO and the OIE, OIE is the Organization for Animal Health, developed also their global action plan. So we had three global action plans. Uh, we teamed up, we collaborated every day, and that was a great thing. Um, by the way, it was also mentioned two years ago that we should bring AMR to the UNGA, the uh, United Nations General Assembly. Now, this global action plan had 
five objectives. One is improve the understanding and the awareness of AMR. Two is to know what's going on, that's surveillance. Three is wash your hands. In fact, reduce the incidence of infection. Four is stewardship, and I was very pleased to see in your uh, framework that you also have a chapter on stewardship. And five is invest in R&D and invest in new antibiotics. Now, the first objective was improve awareness and understanding. Now, they also ask us to develop a World Antibiotic Awareness Week. Now, we did, we developed materials, and we will have a new one in uh, mid-November. But the question is, does it work? Can we change things with a campaign? And I was fascinated by the fact, how can we change behavior? And this is a key slide I would like to show. It shows the consumption in humans in the EU. And I don't have other figures except the EU countries. What you can see is that, again, there is a fourfold difference between countries on the left side and on the right side. So on the right side, you have Romania, France, Italy. And on the other side, you have the Netherlands, Germany, Austria, and so on. Question is, are the people in France, in Italy, less healthy? Do they need more antibiotics? I can tell you this is not the case. The only thing is, this is a cultural phenomenon. I have lived in Sweden, I have lived, of course, in the Netherlands. And if you go to a family doctor with an ear or throat infection, you expect that your family doctor will explain the situation, will reassure you and tell you, take some painkillers, and if it doesn't work, come back in a couple of days. And you are happy. People in Sweden are happy. If you go to a doctor where I live now, close to Geneva, in France, you pay for your doctor. So you want to get a prescription, and you want to have a bag with good pills. That's the expectation. So there is a huge pressure on physicians to prescribe antimicrobials. And of course, it has also to do with your education. And I went to a Dutch university, and I was taught that you don't prescribe antibiotics only if it's really needed. And this is another uh, graph, and that shows in the countries that have a high consumption that uh, the percentage of the family doctors who feel under pressure to prescribe antibiotics when not indicated. And as you can see, that 60% in these countries, 60% of the GPs feel the pressure of the patients. So there is a lot to do. And we hope to educate uh, the general public to tell them that they don't need antibiotics for a sore throat. I don't know, uh, I know in some countries there are kind of commercials uh, on the radio or on TV um, telling people in, uh, in the coming month that if you have a common cold, you don't need antibiotics because it won't work. Um, so we will have this uh, campaign. There is another uh, example, uh, India. India um, was active in this field and they introduced the red line um, on each package of uh, antibiotics. Um, and um, that's a way to trigger attention. And I don't know whether that is effective. I think it's a nice example and we will have a deeper look into this. Um, but also, and there are some Canadians on this picture, but uh, we also would like to invest in uh, workforce uh, education. Because if you pay more attention in your education as vet or as medical doctor or as dentist, because dentist is also important, uh, pharmacist, um, that's of course uh, very important. 
So we have invited experts in this field and asked a Canadian uh, professor, Stephen Hoffman, to do some research into this. Is he here? Stephen Hoffman, no? Okay. Um, and we discussed with experts how to improve uh, the medical curricula and to develop a competence, competency framework um, and also a, a survey of health workers' knowledge and their attitudes. So that's for the future, and I really hope that this, is, uh, that this will work. But academia do play a very important role. Um, so I hope that you will embrace this and that you will take your responsibility in training future uh, medical care people. Then the surveillance. Um, I have a picture here and this shows again, and I'm sorry that it's not very clear, but the pathogens in Southeast Asia and uh, for example uh, the resistance against Klebsiella pneumonia for the third generation of cephalosporins is 34 to 81 percent. So these percentages are really very high and very scary. We have established the global surveillance system. We have now uh, more than uh, 45 countries uh, and we hope to provide first data end of this year. And I'm very happy that also Canada is participating and providing uh, data. Now, here you can see we will, this is an ideal picture. We hope to collect samples from blood, urine, fetus, and uh, swabs. And we are looking for these pathogens. Now, I know that um, this is a kind of dream but I hope that countries can at least provide data on some parts of this. Uh, these are the countries that are enrolled in GLASS and in the future we hope to provide data also on integrated foodborne AMR surveillance, uh, the monitoring of antimicrobial use, consumption and also environmental uh, factors. Now again I would like to mention our Canadian friends who have played a very important role in the integrated foodborne AMR surveillance. Uh, there's a group called Agisar, uh, and, and John is uh, John Conley is one of the members, and he is one of the leading leading figures here. Um, then the, uh, the the third one is reduce the incidence of infection through effective sanitation. Now, I was invited um, um, two weeks ago on a Sunday to speak for the European Medical Doctors Association, um, the Medical Student Association. And I thought, should I go to this, you know, but then I realized if I can talk to the students, the medical students, it's a good investment in future. And they were willing also to sit a Sunday and to listen to AMR presentations. Now it happened that this event was at Semmelweis University. Now maybe you remember the name Semmelweis. It's a kind of sad story because he was not recognized for his discovery, but he discovered that one hospital had a higher mortality than the other one, and finally he discovered that if you just wash your hands, chlorine hand wash, you can reduce mortality. And that was really a huge uh, discovery, but it is a little bit sad that 170 years after this, I still have to tell you that we have a hand hygiene day and it's in your hands and that we have to train all the doctors to wash their hands and nurses. But that's reality. And it sounds very simple, and again, this has to do with behavior, with discipline. Um, uh, but this is, in my view, really a cornerstone of the fight against AMA. It is not very sexy. It's much more sexier to develop new revolutionary antibiotics. But pay attention to infection prevention control in a hospital is key. 
Um, that's why we have developed a document called the Core Components of Implementation of uh, this IPC in hospitals and guidelines. Now, another thing are vaccines, because if you are well vaccinated, you will have less infections and there is less need for uh, antimicrobials in the end. Now, this again is a picture. And what you can see is that this is the uptake of, yes, of uh, influenza. Uh, seasonal influenza vaccination. And again, you can see that there is a huge difference between these countries. And again, this has to do with policy and with commitment and to organize campaigns. So it is possible to have a high uptake, but it requires political commitment. Now, the use of antibiotics in human and animal health. The WHO has a list, it's called the essential medicine list, and it indicates what kind of medicine should be available in countries. Now, we have paid attention to the chapter on antimicrobials. Now, what we have done is, we have looked at uh, 21 syndromes, diseases, pneumonia, ear infection, and so on. Um, and what we have, we have invited experts to discuss what is the appropriate treatment for these uh, syndromes. And in the end, we have distinguished three groups of antibiotics. One group are 29 antibiotics that each country should have on the shelf. They are the, let's say, essential antibiotics that you should use for, as first treatment for these infections. Now, if you have indications of resistance, you should go to a, uh, another list, and that's the so-called watch list. So these antibiotics should only be used when there is an indication. And then the last group is what we call the reserve list, really the last resort options. Now, Interesting is this work, and this was done by Professor Mike Shorland. He provided this as a personal communication. Uh, he looked in several countries, how are they used at this moment? And as you can see, the country on the left side is Gambia, is green, and green is the first group that should be available. Now, and they are using, indeed, uh, this the majority of their antibiotics is in this group. But if you look at a country on the other side, China, they, or Finland, no, China, they have a huge yellow part, and that means that they use antimicrobials of the second group. Now, the question is whether there's always an indication, and I doubt that that is the case. You can also see that Another country is using much more of the reserve, the last resort antibiotics. So it would be great if we could increase the green part and reduce the yellow and even more reduce the red one. And it is possible to reduce that, and sorry that this is not very clear, but a country like Thailand that is very active in the fight against AMR has developed uh, strategies and policies, and one of the results is the average um, percentage of outpatients given antibiotics uh, is, was 30% in 2010, and they were able to reduce it by 12 to 12%. It's the same for upper respiratory tract infections from 57% uh, to 43%. And that's really good, and it shows that policies, stewardship is working. Now, recently I found a meta-analysis meta from Bo and other authors, and they looked at effectiveness of antibiotic stewardship. And they found that this is really effective, in particular in combination with IPC. Um, 
I can't go too much into detail, but this is a very interesting, uh, interesting study. And in a comment from Mark Mendelssohn, he mentioned that, of course, this is possible in Canadian hospitals, but not always possible in low resource countries. So it's good to see if you also could use non-traditional stewards, community health workers. And I think that's a very good idea to see how we can do that. Now, a very particular example are the Netherlands. I have shown you that the Netherlands was champion in low consumption in human sector. But the Netherlands was also champion in the highest consumption, in high consumption, in animal sector. Now, the Netherlands is a large food producer and food exporter. So they had a high consumption. And at one time, one day, the Minister of Agriculture and Health had a meeting, and the Minister of Health was able to convince the Minister of Agriculture, you need to work on a reduction because human health is affected by the use in animal sector. And they agreed to reduce that by 70%. And it's possible to do that. And it did not affect productivity in the Netherlands. Um, I see my time is running out, so I can't go into uh, detail about this. This is another example in Norway. This is the, the salmon production. Um, they use a lot of antibiotics, as you know, some countries. But then they discovered to vaccinate all the fishes one by one, and they were able to reduce it um, almost to zero. And the production has only increased. This is a recent publication from the British Poultry Council. Again, they have reduced the number of critically important antimicrobials by 71%. At the same time, they increased the production by 11%. Now, I asked them, what is the secret here? It's a mindset. They told me it is just a mindset. It is to reduce the use of antibiotics, to replace, to stop using colostin, and so on. Now, we know all these headlines, a magical new antibiotic has been discovered. Um, fantastic, and it will solve all the problems uh, on AMR. Now, this is not the case at all. Often, new antimicrobials are discovered for pathogens that are not that relevant, where we have already antibiotics, and that's why the WHO, with experts, developed the pathogen, the priority pathogen list for R&D. And on top of that is Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, and Enterobacteriaceae. These are the most important gram negatives where we really need to have new antibiotics. So if you invest as company, if you would like to support companies as a government, go and focus on these pathogens. Now, we have also developed a partnership uh, to develop new antibiotics for uh, the low and middle income countries. It is linked to the DNDI, that's the um, Initiative for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Um, they focus on uh, STIs, on uh, sepsis, pediatric. Um, one week ago, there was a meeting uh, several countries pledged uh, in total 56 million euros for this initiative. And one thing I would like to highlight here is um, a new uh, antimicrobial against gonorrhea. It's now in phase three. Um, GARP-P, that's the organization, is helping to develop this. And they have agreed that um, and Tasis, that's the name of the company, will sell this new, when, it's, when it will enter the market, to 44 countries, the high income, high income countries, and the GARP will manufacture and sell to the rest of the world, the most the low income countries. And I think that's a very good, important deal. Then the point of care diagnostics, um, it's important to invest in development of innovative diagnostics. Yes. 
Now, national action plans, we have at this moment uh, more than 80 countries. Uh, a lot of countries are developing their action plans. Here you see an example where we are discussing with health officials, agricultural officials to develop a plan. It's always an integrated approach to gather agriculture environment. And here you see the progress in the world. So that is promising in particular because more than 90% of the world population is now covered by a national action plan. The One Health approach is, of course, key in the fight against AMR. And that's why we collaborate with FAO, OYE, and also other agencies. I would like here to quote uh, a quote from, uh, I would say in Dutch, Herman Barkema. It sounds like a Dutch name. Um, but I think it's really important to realize that when we treat animals with antibiotics, that these antibiotics will end up in environment. And that's also when we produce antibiotics. Uh, this is extremely important and we are all very connected. Okay, this is the list of critically important antimicrobials. I see that I'm running out of time. Now, I would like to, these are the antibiotics that are, that should not be used in agriculture, in food producing animals. Um, I would like to show this slide, it's only one slide, because University of Calgary has done a fantastic job in providing evidence for us to, um, to uh, substantiate the, uh, the guidelines that we will publish in a couple of weeks. And I would like to thank the university. Now, I have seen this when I was in the United States, that if you go to a fast food restaurant, some of them advertise that they serve uh, the meat uh, with uh, antibiotic-free chicken, and that's a great development. This is uh, a chart where you can see that many more uh, fast food chains are serving uh, antibiotic-free, and what I mean is uh, that they don't use the critically important antibiotics. Uh, and this is a very good development. And it's good that there is pressure from consumers. Now, if you look at the climate debate, one thing is that the governments, al almost all the governments, ha have agreed that the increase should not be more than two degrees or one and a half degree or whatever. That's easy to comprehend. But with AMR, it's much more difficult. When are we satisfied? And that's why we are discussing, and we have not finalized this, a framework for monitoring the gap. And I also would like to ask Canada, you have now this plan, but when are you satisfied? With what result? And I can tell you, this is really not easy. There was a high level meeting one year ago. Now, I'm working in this field for more than 20 years. And I always had the feeling I can discuss AMR with my colleagues, with vets, and so on, but not that much is happening. But only when it was, let's say, lifted up to the political level, there was much more attention. Uh, what I learned as a medical doctor is you need, to political you need political attention, you need to have commitment from the highest level. And it was fantastic that one day, one year ago, Heads of states were discussing for one day uh, AMR. I'm now here in Ottawa. We are discussing AMR. But I also would like to show you a few pictures. If you go 20 hours in a plane, you can buy every antibiotic in these shops, grocery stores, and so on. You get this one here, $1, $2, we are not sure whether they are working. Imagine a mother with a sick child traveling a long time um, and getting antibiotics for a sick child that are not working because they are falsified. This is a hospital. This is a 3,000 bed hospital. It's unbelievable. I went to the lab. They have 10 staff in this lab. 
not very well trained. And he was telling me that he was making the so-called discs himself. I can tell you the results are not that reliable. I was very happy to see at least that there was a dispenser. But my colleagues told me, Mark, you know, you need to check whether there's dust on this thing. And there was dust on. So they told me, this is not used. So, scientific academies, you, play a very important role in AMR research. In particular, Canadian research has played a very important role in the animal sector for us as WHO. So this research is the foundation of future policies for AMR policies. And we appreciate the commitment, the engagement from Canada, and we hope that you will continue this leadership. And finally, my dream is that we are also able to preserve antibiotics for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Springer. Um, if you'd stay up here, I think we're going to have time for a few questions right now. You're very tall. This microphone's very high. Um, uh, just a few things I'm hearing are, there's so much there, but at once this issue is dire um, in the cost to human health, financial markets and so forth. Simple in some ways that wash your hands and the more you use, the more you lose are really the markers uh, and we know what to do. We're seeing, we've seen many examples of what works but extremely complex because it requires cultural, behavioral, and political change. It's a mindset, and I'm sure all of you know how hard that is. So uh, we now have time for a few questions for Dr. Springer, and these are questions if there's something that you think can help clarify this issue for everyone here in the room. Um, go ahead. Um, hello. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I'm Marcel Baird, McGill University. Thank you for that presentation. You mentioned the WHO list of essential medicines. If I understand, there's also a project to develop a list of essential diagnostics to ensure the appropriateness that the diagnosis was correct. Could you tell us the status of that initiative? Um, yes. <laughs> now, unfortunately, WHO uh, is not that rich. Uh, we can only do things if we have money, but that looks now quite promising. We get some support and we hope to um, really speed up this project. Now this is of course in particular relevant for low resource countries, for uh, the low resource countries, because we know that um, fever um, there is a kind of point of care uh, diagnostics that can distinguish between uh, malaria. But the result was when it was not malaria, then every child would get antibiotics. So, in fact, it has resulted in an increase in the use of antibiotics. So, in fact, what we are trying to find are cheap point of care anti-diagnostic uh, tools. Now, there is a lot of money. There are prices, the longitude price, uh, I think are one million, but it's very complicated. So if you could support, fantastic. Another question. Good morning. Uh, Baljeet Singh, uh, Dean of Veterinary Medicine, University of Calgary. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, would you comment on the role of the private sector, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, their contributions to this nightmare and their responsibilities uh, on how to get out of this uh, situation? Uh, I don't hear uh, about them in this debate. We talk about the responsibility of governments, NGOs, and the academic sector. Uh, would you comment on that, please? Yes, of course, uh, the pharmaceutical companies are, are um, big players and are very important because they are the ones who could 
develop new antibiotics. At the same time, and this is, and I do understand that this is very difficult, if you are able to find a new antibiotic, you would like to sell this, you would like to get a return on investment. Uh, there are a lot of discussions and initiatives how to solve this dilemma, because we don't want to see that a new discovered antibiotic for a gram-negative will be used and after a few years we will see resistance. So it should only be used in a very restrictive way. So that's why there are now initiatives to find economic models and the, uh, the GARP-P, uh, sorry, the, um, the, the CARBEX, uh, the BARCO in the United States is an initiative. The Wellcome Trust is uh, supporting this development. So that's one side. On the other side, I hope that pharmaceutical companies take their responsibility and don't promote the use of antibiotics in, uh, in countries. Um, of course, that is, this is uh, very uh, delicate and I think we all know how that works in, in your own country. I'm Joanne Dillon from the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, the WHO has been involved for a long time in international surveillance of antimicrobial resistance and in particular the GAS program, gonococcal antimicrobial surveillance program, has been going on since 1990 around the world and has been instrumental for national surveillance programs uh, being implemented, including in Europe and Canada, Latin America and other places. I'm just wondering how so many of these surveillance programs are being integrated into GLASS and what's being done to kind of standardize surveillance and make it easier? Yes, um, it, it is integrated and I have shown you the slide, but that was very small, but um, gonorrhea is integrated in glass. But what is very interesting of this project that you are referring to is that they don't only do um, the surveillance, but they have also uh, organized um, a meeting and a process to discuss treatment based on the results of the surveillance. And they have developed guidance and this is, um, this is uh, very helpful and what I hope in future is that WHO is able to develop guidelines based on the results of surveillance uh, of course, it's always um, uh, important to, let's say, fine-tune it based on the local situation. Uh, but there I see that the role should play a much more important role. Uh, in fact, uh, similar what I did for gonorrhea. Um, there's also a lot of discussion about the duration of the treatment. I don't know whether you have followed that discussion in media. Um, and again, I think that WHO should, and of course, if I say WHO, we always invite experts. So that's how we work. So we invite Jones and, and others to, to tell us, uh, to provide us with the, uh, the evidence. Uh, so I think that we should play uh, a, a better role in this respect. Um, David Patrick, University of British Columbia. Um, I'm interested in your view of the overall global response under the UN at the moment um, to this crisis. With HIV AIDS, we were very late to the table, but one has to argue that things were improved once we had UN AIDS and coordination among U UN agencies. We've had two meetings of a coordinating group in this area. How's it going? Yes. So we have the, inter we have the interagency coordination group, IACG. Um, they um, a little bit, you know, how, how does that work? Um, as you know, it has been decided to establish this group, but um, there was no budget. Now, that's not very helpful if you need to start new work. So, we have now, with support from others, established this group, and I'm very pleased that 
uh, indeed, there are uh, about 15 other UN or non-UN organizations uh, in this, this group. And I am absolutely convinced that we can only, um, let's say, uh, fight AMR if we do that all together. Even if we involve the organization of, um, of customs, and I was very surprised at the beginning, uh, you know, the UN organization on the customs, but then I learned that if it's about trade, if it's about falsified medicine, they do play a very important role. Uh, also, environmental uh, agency is important. So I really hope that this group will become uh, very active and we do have, in a couple of weeks, uh, more meetings. This is the last question, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm Noni McDonald from Dalhousie University and I do a fair amount of work in East Africa every year. And one of the big things that I want to really comment on and expand on your piece is outside of the few major teaching hospitals across East Africa and going down, there is no antimicrobial resistance surveillance, like ZIP, and yet most of the people don't go to those big hospitals, so we really have this huge void in understanding what antimicrobial resistance there is out there where most of the population lives either rurally or in the informal settlements, translation slums, uh, in the big urban centers who never go to those big teaching hospitals. What is WHO going, going to do to help improve the ability to diagnose resistant organisms in these low, very low income resource centers and how can we improve surveillance even if we do it on a sporadic place but at least find out what's going on in the rural communities. Yeah. So Africa has our special attention and uh, Sunday um, I will go to Nairobi to, uh, to discuss with the so-called faith-based organizations because they are very important in, uh, in the health uh, delivery. Um, I don't know whether you know, but the government of Canada has provided WHO huge support for the work on AMR. And we have used that money in particular to organize uh, workshops in, uh, in uh, West Africa. Um, in East Africa, uh, I think it's a little bit better, but in particular in, uh, in West Africa, there it's, it's uh, the, the Francophone uh, countries, uh, they needed a little bit more kind of uh, support. By the way, I also would like to ask, the, the language is an issue, but Canada uh, has a lot of French-speaking experts. If, if you are interested in supporting us, uh, that would be uh, really important. Um, so we have organized several uh, workshops. We are really helping them uh, with the surveillance setting up, integrated surveillance. And I will uh, see next week with my own eyes and discuss with them uh, how to uh, further develop the situation.